Good morning, everyone. I want to set up the, the background of Planet Rock. I've just done a film, I've directed a film on, on my band Rocker's Revenge, and there was a connection between Rocker's Revenge and the Planet Rock record. So this sort of sets up the making of Planet Rock pretty well, and the, the guys you're going to be seeing talking about it are two of the members of, of Rocker's Revenge who worked at a record shop where I first heard a song that influenced the production of Planet Rock. So we could watch this and then, uh, yeah. I had an idea to do something with Trans Europe Express. Ben Bada and I made the A-Track demo and I played it for Arthur. He thought it was cool. That's so I heard the demo uh, that they had done and I thought, yeah, it's okay, but something missing. And you know, as I always would do, I'd go to Music Factory just to listen and get inspired. You'd be in the store for hours, man, listening to what we was playing. We would play so many different things, and you'd be like, yo, what's that? What's that? And I'm listening, listening, and then this record comes on. And I was like, what the fuck record was that? And he was like, yo, bro, it's Numbers by Kraftwerk, you know, amazing. Kraftwerk was my group, and I put it on. He was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. This is what I was looking for without knowing it. I've never heard a beat like that. The sound, everything. And I'm like, God, that beat, that beat is unbelievable. I'm tired, I feel He said, I'm gonna go in the studio and do this tonight with some of my guys. He said, you wanna come? The first time I met African Bombada and Pow Wow and Mr. Big, and they were all young kids. And I'm looking at them, and they're, they're wilding out in the studio. Right. What the hell is going on here? Come on, tell me something. But come on, Mr. Engineer, get it right, get it right. Come on, Mr. Engineer, get it right, get it right. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, and if you don't. They're standing on top of the piano, they're banging on the drums, and I'm like, yo, Arthur, who are these kids? He's like, oh, these are the kids that's going to rap for this thing. I said, oh, you got control of these two? <laughs> After that, Planet Rock came out and you was killer. Yeah, just hit me. Just hit me. Planet Rock blew up instantly. That was my huge break. But the cool thing about Planet Rock was that, you know, uh, it, it just, it was a very futuristic sounding. It sounded like it was tomorrow. Okay, so there's a little background on the record. Um, we went into a studio called Intergalactic Studio. It had a Neve board, which you know was a great board, Rupert Neve, a UK board, and it was it, it it had a lot to do with the sound of the record because it had great EQs, the Neve EQs. Which one? Which way? I'm gonna run that. So we had Neve EQs there, and 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 the thing about you have to you have to envision and. 1982 technology we thought we were on the on the cutting edge of technology and people think that when we made that record it was cutting edge technology but literally we had very little technology i mean we had a we had a fair light which is this this thing and that cost like quarter of a million dollars but the sample rate on it was like maybe one millionth of what's on your phone so literally it was so expensive. It, it, it was made in Australia. It was, uh, um, and we we didn't really use it much. We used it for the orchestra hit, and we used it for an explosion, and that was it. But I mean, the orchestra hit became pretty iconic. So it was sort of one of the trademarks of the record. Then we had a Prophet Five, which we did the strings with the Prophet Five. Everything was played live too. Nothing was sequenced. The uh, so John Roby, who it was the first night I had ever met him, and he he played all the keyboards. So we did strings and, and sound effects, and then we had the mic remove, uh, which was the bass sound. Then we had one delay unit. I mean, to think about it now, it, it, it was crazy. But the delay unit is how we got the sound on uh, Africa Bambata when he goes party people. It sounds like a vorcoder, but it wasn't. It was a tight slap on the PCM 4041. Now, of course, the one thing, the last thing was obviously the most important thing, was Roland 808. 
So the Roland 808 composer, we didn't have a drum machine and, and I wanted the, we knew this track needed a drum machine. I had done all the other raps I had done, records I had done was all live mu music and drummers. And we decided we needed a drum machine. No, the studio didn't have one. So basically we went on the Village Voice looking for a guy with a drum machine, which we found. And it was man with a drum machine. And, he, and I called him up. He said, oh, I have a, a, a Roland 808. So I went to Manny's to check it out, heard the sounds, and said, well, that, that'll work. He brought it in, and I sort of, me and Bambata sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, did the beats, and, and, he, and he inputted them into the, uh, into the 808. And we recorded it, you know, very quickly, and the guy left, and he wouldn't take a check because he didn't trust Tom with the Tommy Boy check. So he, he got paid in cash, and we never knew his details, so he totally missed out on anything to do with Planet Rock for, you know, and he got paid $25 for the session. But then, you know, we tried to find him. His name was Joe. So for years we tried to find him. We never could find him. So it was, a, the, the studio was Intergalactic, which was made famous by the Beastie Boys record, Intergalactic. They used to, they used to hang out there and work there. And as I said, it had an Eve board. The only problem with, it was eight stories up and no elevator. So we had to carry all the equipment up and everything. And, uh, and we went in, it was a nighttime session because um, you know we, we did a lockout. We had eight hours, like starting at around eight o'clock at night through the night and, excuse me. <laughs> My wife has great timing. Uh, and um, we, you know, we went in and it was, we were experimenting really. Um, as it said, Tom had an idea about, Tom and Bam had the idea of using Trans Europe Express, but I thought I didn't really like the groove that they had come up with. So when I, when I heard numbers, I thought, well, we put those two together and that'll, and that'll work. And when we went in and we, and we cut the track, the first night we cut the track, the rappers were there and they were like, they hated it. They literally hated it. They didn't know what to do with it because they had expected uh, the record I had done for previous for Tommy Boy was Jazzy Sensation, which was a slow groove and R&B thing, and 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 they felt comfortable with that. But... The tempo on on Planet Rock was like 128, and it and it's sort of a halftime thing. But, you know, the rappers didn't know how to sit in the, in the beat. So Globe, who was a guy who really wrote all the raps, he went back in and um, he had to rewrite the rap. And the, and, and the guys literally, they, they told me years later that I, I did a movie called 808 and they're interviewed in it. And, uh, and they were like, you know, we thought we'd never do another record. We thought that it wasn't going to happen. And uh, yeah, but they came back in. But the interesting thing is with Planet Rock, all the music we cut, we cut the music for Planet Rock, and after we did the, the Trans Europe Express melody, we knew that we'd probably get in trouble with Kraftwerk, so I had John Roby write another melody, which became the melody for Play at Your Own Risk. And we did all this other music that, you know, we were doing like clavinets and all, like, and piano. So we did like all these other elements that, were never, that weren't used for Planet Rock. So six months later, we went back in and I, and I did an instrumental with all the other music, and, and by that time, Planet Rock was a big hit, and I took it to Jelly Bean, and he played the instrumental with all this new music, and people went literally nuts. So we called some guys, my friends from Boston, who were uh, the Energetics uh, group, and they came down and we did a vocal, and that became Play at Your Own Risk. So here's the track sheet with my scrawling. It looks, I can't, you know, but still have the track sheet. And uh, you want to, Stanley, you want to play some of the music. I'll, I'll play a bit of Planet Rock now. And uh, I usually do this, but it's different, people, different programs. So. People, Dreams about the seats, make your body sway, social. 
live. Get down. Let your soul lead the way. Shake it now. Go, Go ladies. Is this a living dream? Love, life, live. Come play the game. Our world is free. Do it to one but free. So, I mean, those are elements of it. The thing is, giving a master class on that track, there's, it was so uh, intuitive how we did it. it. You couldn't really go back and go, I mean, we programmed the drums and then we, John Roby played everything to the drum beat. The guys came in, did the rap, and, and that was it. You know, There were no secrets to it. it was, we were just creating something new. And when we did it, I felt like we had done something really special. But I, I had the feeling about that be, actually before the rap was on, and I'll show you why. Uh, you want to? We had done all this other music around it, which became "Play at Your Own Risk." When I went home that first night, there was no rap. There were no raps on it, and it was it was a track with the beats and with this, these clavinet parts and the and the bass, and uh, we just couldn't make it work with the rap. So as I said, we didn't use it until, uh, until six months. And we were sitting on it and we sort of forgot about it because the record did so well. You got the drums. Okay. Oh. Uh, the drums are coming. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. With, the, with, the, with that stuff, with the flaps. Put the bass in too. You got the other cloud, or is that?
So we took this home and we were like, oh man, we've done something really cool and the rappers hated this too, so we didn't use we didn't use the clavinets, but that became play your own risk. You wanna put the piano in? So, you know, I think I'll open up to questions because, you know, like I'd rather know what you guys want to actually know about than try to guess. So anyone have questions? I hope someone has to have. Yeah. The vocal effect on African Yeah. What process? Yeah. Well, that was a PCM 41. That was the delay unit. And we just had a really uh, tight slap on it. So it, w it was a delay, but it was so tight that it just sort of flanged and fake flange really it was sort of using it as a flange i mean as i said we didn't have a vocoder we 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 had really limited equipment i mean it was the best but we didn't have tons of things and i think that was one of the reasons that it came out so well because we didn't have to make choices we had limited and we just and we had limited time too i mean we had eight hours to cut the the track and to do the rap and then obviously when we the rappers couldn't do the rap we got another eight hours and then that, I mean, we, we probably did the whole thing in like 25 hours from start to finish in, in the mix. And the mix, you know, the mix, having the Neve board was, you know, crucial because the, the low end on the bass and on the 808 was, you know, and, and the bright, I mean, Neves are the, that was the best board and, and, uh, you know. Yeah, we are. I'm working with with Reservoir, who bought who bought the catalog. We're gonna do uh, quite a few things. Yeah, there'll be like an and there'll be an NFT drop on 808 8, August 8th. I'm doing I'm working on that now. But uh, yeah, we are doing a lot. I mean, they've just sort of I've just gotten in touch with them, and and they're really up for doing things. So you know, it should be it, it it'll be exciting. We're gonna do some cool things with it. You know. What's that? No, no. Well, I mean, the, 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 it, was a, it was a song. Whenever we've done remixes, it, they've never been as good as the original mix. But, you know, I'm, I'm open to, to, to having remixes done and seeing if people could bring out something different. I mean, in the, in the movie, which I, I, people should try to find that movie. I don't know how many people have seen the 808 film, but we did a bunch of remixes at the time, and... Uh, None of them were really, I mean, they were, they were okay, but, you know, I mean, Paul Oakenfeld famously did a remix for, uh, for the movie Swordfish, like, 20 years ago. That, that, was, that was pretty good, you know, he kept pretty, stand, he kept to it, but he added more of a um, breakbeat type of thing. It, it was okay, I mean, but, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm up, I, I, the, the whole remix culture I love, you know, it just usually the things don't come out great, but I'm open to hearing them. Yeah, not not during the cre creation, but obviously once it came out, they like we got lawyers calls, and, and you know that first of all we didn't sample anything, so the record label, you know, the Capital Law, the record label had no no interest. I mean, they thought we sampled it, but when you listen, we we obviously didn't sample. And uh, what Tom did, which was genius, he just upped the he paid them off. I think I think he had to pay them off a hundred grand and. Then they have part of the publishing, but what Todd, Tom did was just up the list price, you know, a, a dollar. Because the, re the record originally came out as 498 list, which meant it probably would sell in the stores for 299 for the 12, and then he upped it to, uh, I'd say 598, and then it, the, the price in the store went up 50 cents, which you know was not a lot at the time, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was genius because it, it didn't end up costing anyone. I mean, the the public sort of paid for it, but uh, but funnily enough, when I when I worked with New Order, one of the reasons they said they worked with me is because that we up the price. They had heard the story of up, us upping the price of the um, of the record, and they thought that was great. And I was like, no, that was Tom, you know, <laughs> but he can't produce records, so you know. What's that? 
Well, yeah, they, I mean, that was Peter Saville, man. They, they lost money on every record in, in the beginning. They literally lost money on every record. So, Arthur, following up on that question, was that the strategy going in to replay the Masters so that you could avoid that sampling? Well, back then, sampling didn't really exist. I mean, the, the, the Fairlight was a sampling synthesizer that you could sample like one, two seconds. I mean, there was no sampling, so it didn't even exist. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that... They didn't. I don't even think they knew what they were talking about as far as that. I, I, you know, in retrospect, they probably didn't even think we sampled because it didn't exist. I mean, the technology at the time. And then a few year, about a year later, the AMS uh, digital reverb was also a sampler, and you could get like two seconds in there. So we would use that for drum sounds. And then a year, maybe six months, the technology was changing really quickly, but. The emulator came out, and then that was a game changer because you could sample quite a bit more and play it on a keyboard. And I started using that on, on IOU, and probably that was the first record I used the, the emulator on. But, but, you know, the technology, it, you know, you had to play everything. I mean, this was probably the first rap record that used drum machines. Before that, all rap records were played. You'd have to get a group in and play it and, you know... You'd call, you'd, you know, you, and, and no one was sampling. This was pre-sampling. No one had a sampler. With the uh, equipment like the Fairlight and the 808, did you have time to get to... No, did you have to figure no. out No time. No, well, what we did was, the, with the 808, the guy, pro, the programmer came, and I was like, I want a cowbell, like, and he showed me the tap button, so I tapped it in, and we didn't, we didn't sequence it at all. I, and, and to this day, I don't know how an 808 works. The only way I do it is I play I play it live. I play it with the with the tap button and and I can I can rock it definitely. But I've uh, I've never I never had the patience to find out and read the manual. Come on, Japanese manuals, forget it. No, so I didn't I didn't I didn't even try to do that. The Fairlight, we just went through sounds and like what sounds you got? Boom, boom. There was like the explosion. We'll use that. And then when when uh, Tom Silverman hit the orchestra hit and it was like whoa wait a minute you know so that was like those were the two things that that's all we used on 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 the uh on the fear light i mean they had a great grand piano and all the piano was live and and uh yeah i mean it was it literally we had no time to we experimented in the playing but you know it was more really intuitive what sounded good and and uh we were just winging it, you know. It wasn't there were no there were no plans. I mean, the plan was the beat. When I heard when I heard numbers, I thought that beat would so work with the rap on it. Now, yeah, I didn't know what the you know, and I knew what the rap was going to be about. But all the all the hooks in the song, okay, the the all the the cities, which I think, well, I don't know. We we came up. I had always loved James Brown records that would mention different cities, right? So. There's our list of cities, you know, New York, D.C., Philly, Atlanta, Miami, Boston, crossing out Newark for some reason. <laughs> I never noticed that, actually. Chicago, Detroit. We got Boston in there again, Chicago, Detroit, L.A., Moscow, Tokyo, London, Peking, Trenton. We, you know, we want, we, listen, we thought it was going to be an international record. We put Munich in there. We put in, you know, Lagos. We, you know, we had, like, all, the, all these... Uh, you know, I thought, I mean, I, I have to be honest, my vision of it was way bigger than the group's vision. They thought, oh, we're getting in the studio, we're going to make a record. Once we started working on it, I, I did see the potential of it, and, and I, did put in a, I, I did put in a lot of the hooks, I have to say. The, 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 the whole thing, rock, rock, to the planet rock, uh, and the cities was my that was my idea, and and you know as a, as a, as a tribute uh, to like James Brown because he used to do all the cities he, he, he in his record, so I thought that would be really cool, and you know it was it was I mean it was a combination of all the people involved for sure. It was like John Roby played amazing, he, the, his musicality stands out in that, and Bambada brought the vibe. The, the, it's funny, the party people is so iconic now. Last night I was at dinner, and this is a true story. I was at dinner, and after the dinner, there are people leaving, getting in the cab. And this guy, I don't, I don't know who he is, he's like, he, he said, party people, and I get party people. And I go, oh, you, you, what do you mean? I go, uh, Planet Rock? Yeah, man. I, I produced it. He didn't even know. He was just using that to like get the party going. And I was like, whoa. 
I said, dude, you don't, and he couldn't believe it either. You know, I had to like prove it to him, you know, whatever. But it was, how, how iconic is that party people? And that's just one of the hooks. I mean, there's so many hooks of the rock and no stop it, all the cities, um, you know. It just, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it, it, Tom always said it's like a, it was a perfect storm and it was the combination of all the people, the rappers, Tom, and you know, that I went to the record shop and heard numbers because if I hadn't heard numbers at that time, it would have been like a down tempo rap with, uh, they, they use the bass line from uh, BT Express, I like it. And so it was, you know, slow and a whole other groove. So it was, you know, the magic of that record was, but you know, those records back then, there was, there were, there was always like a magic to the ones that, that actually hit. The ones that hit had the magic. The others, nah, no magic. Any other questions? I could keep talking, but someone got to give me like a little, uh, um, good. How much kind of like direction did you have to give you? Like, you know, the, the video said that these are some like young kids kind of, you know, around in the studio. How much uh, direction did you have to give as a producer to be able to get that rap? Good, good point. Um, well, they had never been in a studio. It was, it was like they went in and, and literally the way we, we had no photos of them jumping on, but, but for the film, I use a lot of animation for, for magic scenes at uh, the time of, uh, in the 80s. And they did. They, <laughs> they did jump on the piano. They were out of control, and I just had to sort of go in and, you know, Say, guys, come on, let's let let's get to work. I mean, after that, yeah, I mean, you see them in the studio; they'd always fool around, but they, they were. I mean, we say they were kids, but they were like five years younger than I was. But you know, that difference was was big at that time, you know. And uh, but you know, we're still. I mean, we're still all friends, and that was forty years ago. So we've we've stayed. You know, we've had our ups and downs for sure. But, but I, I talked to the. Uh, to the rappers all the time, to Biggs and, and, and Globe, and, and they're going to be involved in what I'm doing. You know, we're going to do some new, maybe new lyrics for, for it. I, I mean, it, if it doesn't work, I, I won't do it because, you know, it, it could be really bad, but you never know. It could be, it's again, experimenting is what producing for me is all about. So, you know, now, obviously back then, I didn't, you didn't, I didn't have the control I do now. I could do it all myself. But the magic was all the people. So it's sort of trying to get back to that way of creating records. Obviously, the last few years, it, it's been done all, all online. But I think getting in the room, I mean, I always thought that the best records brought really diverse cultures together, which obviously, you know, this had the technology from Japan and musicality from Germany and the street thing from the Bronx and, you know, whatever my vibe was from where I came from. So I thought all that together sort of created something uh, really unique. And, and uh, you know, and then after that, a lot of people started making records that were inspired by it, which to me was great because it created a lot of great, cool music and that whole electro scene in the 80s, you know, it was a magic time, and, and I think we made really cool music. So put it this way, it so influences the sound now of rap and hip-hop. That, that whole sound is the 808 sound. I mean, you don't, you don't hear anything but 808-inspired beats and sounds and, 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 you know, and, all, and all rap music. I mean, and, all, and pop music now, too. I mean, anything Pharrell does, I mean, they're all... I mean, when you see the 808 movie, I... I you, everyone should go try to watch it because it, it 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 really tells that story and it's a really cool movie. When you're um, producing now, do you try and limit yourself? So I try. It's really difficult, but I limit myself by my lack of really. I'm not that good with with the gear, so I I I, I use my I I use Logic and I use it like you would. 20 years ago, I just use it like really so, uh, it, it, I don't use the, all the functions, put it that way. And, and I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, I have a lot of plug-in sound things, but I always go back to the same sounds and, and, you know, I make music or I was making music like every day. I always make music and, and, uh, it's sort of like my, my, Sort of like my meditation is sort of doing a track, but but since I started the film that you saw two minutes of, it, it's a feature film, and and 
I directed the film while I was producing a Rocker's Revenge new album. So I would not suggest anyone ever doing that. You know, you're in the studio trying to like think with your ears and then you also got to be thinking with your eyes. And it was just uh, not anything I'd ever do again. But but the results are really good. When, when it, hopefully it will be out by the end of the year. Well, the first time I played it out, I played it out at a, at a record pool. I think it was like a Christmas party. I, I, the, the whole dates on, on Planet Rock, they, they say it came out in, in April, but we're, we're, I know that I played it at a record pool party during Christmas in New York. At Judy, I think it was Judy Weinstein's record pool. And I remember playing it and people went nuts, literally. It was just like instantaneous. What the fuck is that record? And then... When we okay, so when we first cut the acetate, this is these yeah these are pretty good stories. When we first cut the acetate, Herb Powers was was a mastering engineer, who you know he's the iconic guy. He did all the dance records and stuff, but he had never worked on a record that had it. It was the first record that used an 808, you know, and he didn't hear the subtones, and he's like pushing it, and he was he was doing the he was doing the mastering on on Yamaha speakers, small. Uh, um, and his tens, and basically, when he uh, when we took it out the first time, we took it out to a record shop in in, in New York called the um, Rock and Soul. We brought it in, and that was like the real shop to you know you test it out in the shop. You'd bring it in and try to prove to the buyer that it was going to sell. And we put it on, and it blew the speakers. <laughs> And oh, and the, and the woman there, I think her name was Sylvia. She was so pissed off, man. She. <laughs> And but we brought it to Music Factory, the scene of the crime of me hearing the numbers. And someone came up when when it was on, and someone came up and offered a hundred dollars for the acetate. So we were like, yo, we we got a hit here, you know. And and then I started taking it out to clubs, and the clubs I'd take it to were the Funhouse, Danceteria, Paradise Garage, and and you know everyone played played the, you know back then I could bring a record in. Even I had had a little success before it, bring a record in and they, listen to it, put it on. You know, I mean, literally, you know, like nowadays people need a month with it, you know, they're, they're, to get it in a set. But back then it was really you bring in a record and they'd hear it and they'd be excited to play something new. And it it really, it took off like instantaneous, man. Like the fun house, it became like their anthem. And then all the other, as I said, would, would play at your own risk. That we, we didn't even think about, you know, because Planet Rock, the original mix, the, the vocal, the rap version, and then the instrumental, which was very different, very different mix. And most people were playing the instrumental before they played the rap because rap was still new and, 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 and club DJs didn't really want to play the rap. So they, they were playing the instrumental and then they flipped it over to the rap as rap got bigger because before that it was like, you know, it was uh, it was pre the message. It was it was rapper's delight. It was like that kind of rap. There was nothing really ex really that experimental. So we didn't really think about the music we had recorded, the other music. And then when we went back in, I said, oh, "I'll do a mix for it." And I brought it to Jelly. And as I said, I brought it to Jelly Bean, and the crowd went nuts because they hear the beginning. It, they thought it was the instrumental of Planet Rock. And then when all the other music came on, I, I, I have to say it was. Uh, Quite, quite a moment, and then we went back and then we did the vocals. Any other questions? Okay, you got me for a few more minutes, guys. Come on, I'll answer any question. <laughs> Was there something in the production that I thought I would never do it again? No, in the uh, next, next production, you were like, okay, that's uh, something I'm looking forward Well, I mean, the next, okay, good, good, actually, good question. Um, the next record I made was Walking on Sunshine by Rocker's Revenge. I did that more of a past, it was, it was like a mega mix. I was trying to do a mega mix but doing it new and all, all re-recorded. And we used the orchestra hit. I mean, I used the orchestra hit. I killed that. I mean, basically, it was in that. It was in IOU, the orchestra hit. Confusion? No. So I, 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 I knew it was not into the orchestra hit. But so I used, you know, I repeated that. But by the time 
Planet Rock had such a long life through Planet Rock and then Play Your Own Wrist that by the time we did our next record, which was Looking for the Perfect Beat, that Play Your Own Wrist sound had been so overused and so many people did tracks that were very similar that I thought we've got to go in a different direction. I didn't want to use the same beat and I didn't want to use the same sounds or anything. So we went in and, and that's why it's called Looking for the Perfect Beat because we were like, we're looking for, I, I said, we're looking for a perfect beat. We already found the perfect beat. We're never going to find another perfect beat, but here's all these other really cool beats. And, and that's how the concept of that song came about. I mean, the pressure we were under to follow up Planet Rock, it was really heavy because it was such an iconic song and everyone was copying it. And we, I, I did not want to do another Planet Rock. I didn't want to do anything that, there's no similarity really between the two. Like, Looking for the Perfect Beat is, I like, I mean, that's my favorite record of the, of the three or the four I, I did with Soul Sonic because it's so fresh, you can't say that it's derivative of anything. It's just sort of another sound and very musical and very orchestral and the music arrangement and all, and all of it and the rap. And, you know, I mean, the records I made with Soul Sonic, I made four of them. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm super proud of all of them um, just because, you know, I, I, we never did it. The other thing is we never did an album at the time, which was literally insane because Tom had signed some deal with a group and, if he had done the album, he would have had to pay him like more than he was paying him. And he never did an album until like years later, this compilation album, which I mean, can you imagine having a record as big as Planet Rock and then Perfect Beat sold 400. I mean, it sold a lot of 12 inch records. And then we didn't do an album and we did Renegades of Funk and that sold a lot, too. And it just there was never an I mean. We only needed five more tracks. It's, it's insanity. Looking back, like the missed opportunities in that situation were crazy, you know? Did you ever worry that having paid off the guy with the drum machine, you wouldn't be able to get the drums right on the next one? Um, no, I didn't worry, literally, because I went out and bought an 808. I bought one right away, and literally he didn't, I mean, I mean we didn't use the the composer on it. We literally had an A and a B section and one and two. So we had like four different parts. And when we changed, there's only one change when it goes into uh, one of, we can play it in a second. It goes into this other beat, which was from the record Super Sperm and uh, Captain Sky. And it, it's where that, it's in the middle, probably right, yeah, when it goes, it's a different beat. I think it's here. Yeah, right there, that's a different beat. So basically we just, we may have even punched that in. I'm not even sure. We may have been playing it and then, okay, the change, boom. You know, I think we may have done that or it would have been just one switch. So it, it, it uh, yeah, I mean, I learned, I mean, the thing is I stopped using the 808 really quickly and I think that, that was probably a mistake. I started using other drum machines because it, 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 you know, it, it obviously everyone was using the 808, so I figured let me try to use something different. And I'm walking on sunshine, I use the DMX, and and the DMX was more. It was it was the DMX. It was the system they put out a DMX an Oberheim synthesizer, the OB8, and they had the the the, the sequencer. So it was literally something i and i worked with fred czar on that and that was meant to see, sync up and play but it it drifted it the drums and and the keyboards by the end it drifted because we had midi i think it was right in the beginning of midi or maybe it was pre-midi but there was a sync tone i mean all this stuff sounds so ancient now but uh literally and that record by the end it had come out of time but i had a live bass player play on top of it and live percussion so it made it, it, it feels live because it, 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 you know, it, it was breathing because of the, because of the technology screwing up, which, which was cool because it ended up working fine. Looking for the perfect beat had 808 and then Renegades of Funk, we had a bit of 808, but you know, it, I, I really stopped using it because I used it on IOU and on 
confusion and it just sort of like became everywhere. And then when I heard when Jam and, uh, and Lewis used it on um, SOS band, I was like, oh shit, you know, now we've been found out, we can't use it anymore. So anyone else? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. The, I mean, uh, yeah, American one for sure. There was there was some Japanese records that used it before. Yellow Magic Orchestra used the 808 like uh, probably six months before. Because uh, I mean, they obviously it was a Japanese instrument. They had it before we did, it, and they would have had it for free. And you know, and Roland in making the film 808, I went. I got to go to Japan and meet Mr. Kakaheshi. Uh, before he passed away, and I interviewed him, and I, I, you know, it was amazing, because literally, check this out, so they have a museum, a Roland museum there, and they have every piece of gear, uh, all the proto, before, before the 808, they had a lot of gear, and he, he had worked at another company, so there were all these other drum machines. They gave me the keys to the place, and they brought, I said, I need an amp, I want to hook up these, because they weren't, no one ever uses the machines, I was like, give me that one, give me that one, hooked it up, making beats, recording them, and I get to where the 808's meant to be, and it's not there. And I'm like going, oh, shit, I know what's going to happen. I go to his office, we have lunch, and I see there's like a red velvet thing laying on a table, and I'm like, okay, we have lunch. He goes over, pulls it up, and there's the 808. Make me a beat, you know? And I had to, I had to make beats for the guy who created the 808 and like with him standing right there you know and he I think I got him dancing you know he was he was okay but it was it was a great moment for me and and uh I felt really honored because he he hadn't ever done that kind of interview and I really worked I mean I worked on getting to see him I mean for a year and the people at Roland actually couldn't believe he did it I mean they were like he'll never do it he's not. I go no keep asking and 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 then they had us go and I I flew over, uh, for, I went to Japan for two days. It was my birthday. And I had to get back the next day. I couldn't, you know, we, we, and, and we went in and we had this magic, uh, it was amazing. It was an ama amazing day. And then he, he passed away a year later. And the thing is, the guy was so funny. He had lived in America for so long. He lived in LA a lot. And he was, he was like the first person I ever knew who was, well, no, actually that's not true. He's a, he was the type of guy, he was, a, he was like a creator, an inventor, but he also was a great salesman. So when you think about Steve Jobs or people like that who can do that, he was, the, he was very similar to that. You know, he really, he really you know, was, was a creator, and yet he could also get up and tell jokes and, and really, he, yeah, he was an amazing guy, amazing guy. Anyone else? You got one? Anyone? <laughs> Done? We done? I don't know if the last last chance for questions. I guess we're done. You can why don't we you can you can play some more of the record as we go, I guess.